Good morning and God bless you all. Welcome to our video online worship for the day. It's good to have you join us and I thank you for participating in this new way of being church. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, we rejoice in you and we thank you for the opportunity to reach our community through these strange and electronic means. And Lord, it's not the same as gathering at your house, but it'll do for now. And we pray your blessings to flow upon us and upon everybody that's participating in this. And may your glory be revealed. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. probably seen a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or some kind of logo with the no fear emblem on it. The no fear clothing brand was launched in the early 1990s. 
it quickly became popular with the motocross racers and the snowboarders and the youth culture and all the X Games crowd. And no fear is the rallying cry of that cutting-edge lifestyle, the extreme sports culture, and all the cool people that are not afraid to take risks and make the next dare. No fear is popular because it describes the characteristic and personality trait that we wish we had that we wish we had, as if pasting it on my dashboard will make it to be true. We want to pretend that we are fearless all the time. We want to pretend that we have a firm grip on the world and nothing is going to slow us down. And the truth is far from that, isn't it? And even the boldest of us, the strongest and the bravest and the manliest men among men, if you look deep inside, you're going to recognize that you have some fears and anxieties. You have some things that are not quite settled in your mind. And if you look around at humanity, you will readily see that we're quite a fearful bunch. And those fears come in sometimes and hinder us and guide our behavior, and sometimes even control our lives. And of course, in the past months, fear of illness, or worse, has taken hold, and the pandemic has impacted all of our lives. It's kind of become the narrative, and nobody wants to get it. And we say it, and we know what it means without ever saying the word, it. So how do we cope? And how do we respond to that? And how do we overcome that and live our lives in a reasonable way and not let fears regulate us and at the same time find the balance of appropriate and reasonable measures and caution for our health and well-being and that of our community? As always, we go to the Word of God. I'm going to be in 1 John chapter 4, and verse 17 through 19 talks about fear and the connection between fear and love. Interesting. John writes, love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. According to John, the connection is not between fear and courage. It's between fear and love. And if we have fear, then we don't have a perfect love. And if we have experience with and we know that perfect love of God, then we get set free from fear. And that's worth examining. Let's think for a minute, what causes fear? Where, what is the source of fear? Why do we have fear at all? The specifics of what we are fearful of would be different for each of us, but there's a root cause and there's a common denominator in fear, and I think it has to do with control. We like to think that we're in control of our lives, have a firm grip on things, have some predictability, have some regularity, and when we lose that control, we lose that predictability that creates anxiety in us. What causes you fear? Isn't it the unknown, the mysterious, the things that you cannot predict or foresee, you have no control over? And certainly in this era of infectious disease, when we have so very little control, and it's all a tremendous mystery, and we just don't know the outcome, there's a good deal of fear in the world today. But then the Bible comes along and says, fear not, I am with you. Do not fear. 
Do not be afraid time and time again. And I didn't count it myself, but they say it's 365 times in the Bible we get a message, don't fear. And that's one for every day. And time and again we have to be reminded of that. We have to be told that because we have this natural inclination and this natural emotion that comes along in these unpredictable circumstances. So back to our text in 17 and 18, it talks about this perfect love and how being love casts out our fears. And now specifically here, John is speaking of the final judgment, the fear of hell. And if we have the love of God, if love is perfected among us, then we ought not have any of that fear, but we can instead have confidence and boldness. And if we can have boldness in that extreme circumstance, in that ultimate judgment, the divine and total judgment of God, and the ultimate destruction of the enemies of God, then it stands to reason we don't have to have fear of anything lesser than that either. Love has been perfected among us. Love has been perfected among us. And that's another way of saying that love has done its work in us and completed us and love has been fulfilled among us. It's not to say that you or I know how to love perfectly because we don't. When we talk about something being perfect in our English language in the world today, we we imagine something that is absolutely pure and without flaw, and it's exact and perfect in every way. That's not us, and that's not what John is saying here. In the Bible, when we see that word perfected, it's a unique way of saying that the process has been completed in it. It has done its work and come to the desired result. For example, if you're sick and you go see your doctor, that doesn't make you better. You get your medicine from the pharmacy and it doesn't make you better. You got to take the medicine and put it in your body and let it do its work in you. And as you go through that process, you are healed. You are then healed perfected in the biblical sense, following the process. And love, that divine love of God, is doing its process and will continue to do its process in us. It's working on us. The key word of the Bible, the core of the message of God's word to you, is love. God loves you beyond measure. God loves people. God wants to redeem and restore people. God wants to build people up and bless them and let them know how much they are loved. And in spite of sin and in spite of failures and hardships and difficulties, God loves you. And he accepts you for who you are. And he loves you in a way that is whole and pure and restorative. But that love of God is not complete, is not perfected simply by receiving it. It does its work in us. It changes us. It redeems us. And that love of God is not complete until we return it to God and return it to the people around us. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, but you must also love your neighbor as yourself. And so what in the world does that have to do with living without fear? I'm glad you asked. God's love for us, God's acceptance to us in our lives, in our condition, even with our faults, and failures gives us confidence that we will stand. Confidence that we can, in fact, face the world and deal with and overcome the challenges and survive in spite of our fears. 
We fear those things that are unknown. We fear those things that we cannot control. We question our own abilities to face the uncertain. It's the world and the enemy that tells you you can't hack it. You can't do it. They're going to get you. You're going to crash and burn and you're not able. Be afraid. Run and hide. Pack up and quit because you can't even handle your own life. That's the world. That's the enemy. God says, I am with you. God says, I believe in you. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God says, you are whole and complete in Christ. God says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. When you experience God's perfect love, when his love comes into us and changes us, and redeems us, and we become a conduit for that love, and it goes out into the lives of the people around us. And we can have so t- such total confidence that yes, we are his children. Yes, he is with me. And yes, I can truly walk in that grace and glory and light and power, and we have confidence to face, as it says here, to face the day of judgment And we can have boldness on that day. Why should we be afraid of anything less than that? You follow that? You with me? And we don't gain that confidence by being religious and uh, doing all the right things. We don't gain our confidence of some kind of expectation of perfection in our own lives but we're all of a sudden going to wake up and have all the answers and get it all figured out. We gain confidence by knowing how much God loves us, by knowing that we are the accepted and beloved in Christ, by knowing that he cares, by recognizing how much he has done for us and will continue to do for us, and that no matter what happens, God still loves me, and his love is everlasting. Romans chapter 8 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Should tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written for your sake, we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So if I face bitter tragedy, if I face the utter collapse and ruin on the earth in the eyes of men, if I face sickness or even my own death, nothing changes the simple fact that God loves me and I belong to him. Whom shall I fear? I belong to the almighty of all the universe. Verse 18 of 1 John tells us that God's eternal love casts out our fears. And when we comprehend how very much God loves us and that he has got us and that nothing on earth can separate us from that love of God and no matter what happens, God's love is still going to be there. Now, there's another side to this coin. Does the love of God, does that perfect and complete and divine love of God make me immune to bad things? Does it make me impervious to all things difficult? Does the fact that God loves me make me invincible and immune to sickness and disease and hardship? Not at all. Absolutely not. And it's foolish and ignorant to think so. I have a confession to make to you all. A couple years ago, I was driving in my car. And I admit, I was in violation. I was talking on my phone while I was driving my car. And I wasn't wearing a seatbelt. Foolish, I know. And as it should be, I got pulled over by one of our local law enforcement officers. And the officer happened to know who I was, that I'm the pastor of the church. And he said to me, Pastor Brian, 
Does Jesus love you so much that he will override the law of physics for you and prevent you from crashing through your windshield because of your distracted driving? And I had to say, no, <laughs> he doesn't. Because physics still applies even if God loves me. And the laws of infectious disease still apply even if God loves you. And I still use oven mitts when I take a hot pan out of the stove. That's not fear. That's knowing how the world works. <laughs> That's being smart. That's using our God-given brains to think about what we're doing and using a little bit of caution in uncertain circumstances. And so we take our social distance, we sanitize our hands. We have some limitations on how many people gather in one place at one time. And as the imminent danger of disease passes, we'll modify those things accordingly. And we'll take whatever measures are appropriate. That's not fear. That's just being smart. But we don't let fear overcome us. And we don't go off the deep end with anxiety and worry and let it consume us. And we certainly don't let it hinder our lives or impact our sanity or cause us unnecessary stress or worry or concern. We'll finish it up in verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. We love him because he first loved us when we recognize the totality of God's love for us, when we comprehend that he himself initiates love and restoration and redemption, when we are able to set aside our own faulty vision of God and his grace and see it and really experience it, we cannot help but love God in return. And we cannot help but be humbled by that love and overwhelmed by the majesty of it all. And it changes us. And we return God's love. And we express that love to the people around us. If we have this love for God, then we're going to start to love the things that God loves most, which of course is people his creation, his world. And one more step in the chain of logic. If we love the things that God loves, if we love the people that God loves, we're going to keep our cooties to ourselves, and we're going to have that social distance and care for the others as much as I care for myself and respect their needs and their perspectives, especially those whose physical health or emotional state may not be quite the same as yours. My friends, do not let fear be your companion. Don't let fear be a partner in your life. Take courage, take heart, because of the simple fact that God loves you and is with you. And he will be with you in every circumstance. He loves you infinitely, beyond measure, beyond comprehension and his love will strengthen you and guide you and guard you and he has gifted you with wisdom and understanding to know how to navigate the strange world that we are living in these days it is a joy to have you join us electronically and I look forward to the day when we can gather again in the church house, and I feel good that those days are coming again soon. God bless you all. We will see you then.